Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcia Baker. I'm the program director with the SADS Foundation. I want to welcome you to day two of our SADS Foundation virtual conference. Our first session is a Q&A session entitled Breakfast with Mike and Hari. We're privileged to have both doctors Michael Ackerman, a genetic cardiologist from Mayo Clinic, and Hari Krishna Tandri, a cardiac electrophysiologist and co-director of Johns Hopkins Arithmogenic Right Ventricular Cardiomyopathy Program with us. We already have a number of questions posted in advance and uh, Dr. Ackerman and uh, Tandri will be um, addressing those as appropriate. For those joining us now, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A section of this agenda session, Breakfast with Mike and Hari. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Zackerman and Dr. Tondry. Thanks so much, Marcia. And good morning, Dr. Tondry. Good morning, good morning, Mike. Good morning, Marcia. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, a fantastic morning. Let's just uh, start with taking the questions. I think we have a lot to answer. And good morning to everybody at the SADS uh, joining us for breakfast with Mike and Hari. And uh, thanks for the uh, flexibility and the schedule change. I'm joining all of you here in a hotel manager's room of a super aid hotel. They let me go into this manager's room so that I wouldn't bother my wife while she's getting dressed and ready for the funeral. And uh, so we have, and I announced it on SADS Facebook Live. In fact, we learned of the death of my uh, wife cousin's husband after a three year battle from uh, a brain tumor uh, on Facebook Live a week ago yesterday. And so for those of you who are on Facebook Live, uh, this is the follow-up to that. And um, it's, why, it's why we had to move lunch with Hari and Mike uh, down to breakfast uh, because lunch is right during the funeral. So I'm glad everybody joined us. I see some familiar names on the side and I'm seeing the questions. So I'm gonna multitask, Hari. I've got the phone with the questions wow. and we'll just present them in real time. Uh, and we'll start with Gemma. So Gemma, uh, thanks for kicking it off. And, and Hari, she's wondering about why does Natalaw, which is a beta blocker, and for all of you out there, it really is the preferred beta blocker for most of our channelopathies of long QT and CPVT. But she's wondering why does it have sleep problems associated with it? Her daughter wakes up several times during the night and then can't fall asleep and so forth. So maybe more general in terms of beta blocker side effects, but I would say in general, Gamma, I don't know the why in terms of sleep problems with beta blocker. I don't know, if Hari, if you have any ideas, but it's an uncommon side effect, but I've definitely seen it. And I've seen it with enough frequency with really almost all of the beta blockers. So I don't think it's Natalaw unique. Uh, I've certainly seen it with Propranolol and even the so-called beta-1 selective beta blockers of metoprolol, which we don't use for long QT and CPVT. Um, so uh, there's a variety of strategies in terms of just looking into general sleep hygiene and um, you know, perhaps uh, thinking about melatonin. But Ari, in your experience, have you seen this as a very common side effect? I haven't. I probably would say maybe in the three, four, five percent uh, complaint territory? Uh, I agree with you, Mike. I think the, the whole idea of, uh, you know, uh, sleep and beta blockers is pretty complicated. I think it, we see this sporadically in patients where, you know, uh, sleep problems predominate as well, but I somehow suspect that these are um, uh, a, a, what a complex interaction and not a true and true direct effect of the beta blocker on adjusting the sleep cycle. Um, so as such, you know, we, we have a lot of patients who take Natalol in the RBC and, and, and we do have patients even taking metoprolol, having the sleep disturbances and so on. It's not really, um, I would say, a direct um, probable effect of the beta blocker, but it's, a, it's an interaction with, uh, you know, with the multiple other factors that cause sleep disturbances in these patients. Great, thanks. A number two from Amy, um, and good morning, Amy. What should you do if you miss a dose of our medicines, beta blockers or flecainide? And I think one of the things there with that, Amy, is the, one of the reasons I love Natalol, besides it being, I think, therapeutically superior, superior 
is it intrinsically has a very long life in the body. So there's forgiveness with a missed dose. So I would tell my, when my patients tell me and I ask, how often do you miss your natal on a monthly basis? Never a month, one a month, two a month. If they're in that never one or two per month territory, there's no scolding because there's plenty of forgiveness. If they're forgetting once a week, then once a week often means one or two or three times a week in reality. And there you actually could make things worse for a patient with long QT or CPVT with haphazard dosing, hit and miss kind of dosing. Um, Hari, what would you say with Flecainide? What's kind of your uh, medication adherence conversation about missing doses of Flecainide? So I think most of our patients take flecainide because of PVCs or have uh, you know, had a history of sustained VT and whatnot. What we need to understand is that PVCs are constant and they are, you will probably see even increased in PVC count just before your next dose. So there is a, 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 a elevation in your plasma concentration of the drug as soon as you take it within two hours, you reach a good effect. But then it just tails off as the as you wait through the dosing. So for patients who take for PVCs, you will notice that you during that the, the drug free period you may actually have more PVCs. It really has not much of a consequence. I would say that instead of taking another pill uh, in the interim, I'll just stick with your dosing. If you miss the morning dose, it's okay. Just stick with the evening dose. Don't worry too much about it. Nothing's going to happen to you. And so let's stick with flecainide a little bit, not from the adherence or side effect, but what you all are learning for its role in ARVC. So as many of our patients with CPVT know, flecainide really has become standard of care. And I would say for most of my CPVT patients, I'm treating you with combination drug therapy with Natalol as the beta blocker and flecainide. And I think flecainide for ARVC is newer on the scene. I think that would be fair, but there's some exciting developments and you all are leading a study about flecainide, I, I, I think. Yes. Um, but what's your thoughts about, about flecainide? I've had concerns in my own mind in the past of if there is a down regulation of sodium current from an ARVC mutation, uh, would flecainide be a good idea or potentially a bad idea? And I really struggle with that decision in a patient of mine with ARVC who ultimately went to transplant because I was too concerned about sort of the, the other side of the two-edged sword. But where are you with flecainide and ARVC? I think it's kind of a, an exciting area of, of, of study right now. Sure, I think that, that's a great question. We also had lots of uh, you know, reservations going into the flecainide trial and also trying to use flecainide as a primary drug for these patients. but. What is so surprising is that ARVC shares a very common phenotype with the CPVT, the way in which they behave, um, the, their adrenergic response um, to, and their ability to uh, develop VT in, in the setting of exer exercise or exertion and so on and so forth. And then I think one of the important effects of flecainide is to prevent this intracellular calcium region. Mario Del Mar and his group in New York studied flecainide in, in mutated mice and found that it substantially reduced arrhythmias, but did not lead to worsening uh, LV function or change in the microbial structure, at least in the, in the, in the, in the follow-up period in those mice. So they are a big proponent that flecainide um, uh, has a big influence on um, the arrhythmogenesis without affecting structural function in ARVC. And the great thing about these patients is that most of them have preserved cardiac function. So it's not like we're giving this in patients who have uh, cardiomyopathy and severe cardiomyopathy to begin with. So in, in, in most subjects who have preserved LV function, this is, has become my go-to drug um, yeah. to, to treat, which is a big shift from where we started to where we are now. But uh, I completely agree, flecainides has really become a uh, first line treatment for us. Um, and it, we, we've had fantastic results with those. Yeah. The flexibility of how you use it, the lack of long term toxicity like amiodarone, all makes it a very important choice uh, for using uh, this type of cardiomyopathy. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think my two most favorite medications is Natalol and Flecainide, and it's incredible to see Flecainide's role emerge in ARVC, and, and, and um, I'm looking forward to the official results uh, that, that sort of confirm what you're observing and what we're observing, you know, with sort of boots on the ground. Here's a question from Claire. It's a good one. We wrestle with it a lot. She says, I've had an ICD implanted for 10 years. It was done 10 years ago for type one long QT. It's never gone off. Would you should suggest that it be removed? So removal or uh, reversal of therapies is something, uh, Claire, that I would say in the past, the mindset out there was once an ICD, forever an ICD. And I have rejected that strategy philosophy for 20 years now. And I sort of view it more, Claire, as uh, a for now strategy and a for now until and unless we're smarter than what we were. And you might see that in the case of long QT1 10 years ago, uh, we probably weren't using an ICD 10 years ago. So maybe it took a while for, for them to catch up, but let's say back then, that was a reasonable for now strategy. But now it's 10 years later, and then the balance of power might have shifted to where it may or may not make sense to continue it. And so I think what I tend to do is weigh the risks and benefits and the balance with my patient. I might not think their disease needs the ICD any longer, but they've had a beautiful 10 year run with it with no complications, is providing tremendous peace of mind, uh, then we might actually continue it, even though I think the therapeutic necessity may not be there any longer. Uh, on the other hand, during that 10 years, you're on your third generator, there've been three fractures, you've had shocks by mistake, and then I would talk to you and say, well, you look, I never would have put it in in the first place because I don't think your substrate needs it, then I don't feel obliged to continue with a treatment that somebody else felt was best at the time that they recommended it. And I think, Hari, in ARVC, you wrestle with this a lot too, where uh, some P patients with ARVC get ICDs really quickly out there. And then you're saying to yourself, wait a second, I'm not sure they need this yet or ever because their substrate's pretty tame in their bodies. So what do you do when you encounter this scenario? I think it's a, this is a very uh, important question. I think we face in two different scenarios. One where somebody's quickly jumped the gun and said, you have ARVC, I'm gonna put a defibrillator in you. Uh, and the data is not really clear that they actually meet all criteria. Uh, and it's in some cases, they clearly have idiopathic VT and somebody had just put a defibrillator in them. It does take a lot to take away therapy. Um, it does take a lot of, testing and a lot of proving and making sure that you're doing the right thing to take away therapy. But we have done that because we've gone through those emotions of systematically re-evaluating them and showing that they don't have the disease and taking the defibrillator out. But I also agree with you, Mike, on, 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 on the fact that it's in patients where there has not been any downside, the diagnosis is kind of indeterminate, it's not really clear, it becomes a shared decision-making you just tell the patient, look, taking it out is a procedure. Uh, pulling a lead out after five or six years is a procedure. And, and so you have to weigh the risks and benefits and we leave things alone. But if there has been lead fracture, patients had an infection or uh, inappropriate shock, then it becomes that the therapy is worse than you know, what their underlying condition is. And so we do go ahead and, and recommend uh, taking the device out. So it's really, I think it's no one size fits all, especially in a structural disease where the progression is not really clear. Um, so there is a lot of shared decision making that goes with the, uh, with the patient and physician. And more importantly, it's always that, you know, what do we know now better than what we knew before? Like exactly what you said. We, again, we assess with the available information and make the best judgment for the patient. Great. I'll take the next one. And then the, the, the one on deck is clearly for you to start with. And, uh, but Samantha's asking uh, for her, for patients with long QT syndrome, what can they take for nausea and vomiting? And, and uh, I would say they can take a lot because honestly, many of the medicines 
that are on the QT hit list, which the patients know, www.crediblemeds.org, that hit list of potential QT prolonging medications isn't equally dangerous or equal potent. There's a tremendous gradation. And so I, I've actually argued, and I think we're working on at Credible Meds, trying to give some sort of signal as to you know, how off limits should that medication be. In my own practice, any prescription, any medication that you can take without a prescription, even if it's on the hit list, it's really, really weak. And I'd rather have you take care of your symptoms than to be miserable uh, out of QT fear when there's no reason to have QT fear. Uh, for operations where there might be post-operative nausea, I think it's really helpful for the anesthesia team to be thinking about preoperative uh, steroid, uh, which is an effective anti-nausea strategy and has zero QT concern. Post-operative nausea when you're under surveillance they can give anything they want, frankly. And, and even a uh, medicine, very effective nausea medicine, Ondansetron, trade name Zofran, it's on the list. Yes, I acknowledge that. But I think by itself, if that's the only potential QT agitator, it's really wimpy. And I'd rather have you address your nausea and vomiting than to be miserable. So I don't have a lot of QT fear uh, when it comes to the anti-emetics or the nausea and vomiting drugs. Uh, Christy's asking Hari, um, it's a long question, but the punchline is how important are lifestyle factors in preventing progression of disease for ARVC, ACM, and the arrhythmic side, the BT? She, she says that high intensity exercise has been called out as bad. We can talk about that. But let's assume that high intensity is not a great ARVC kind of oil and water. Maybe it doesn't mix that well together. But what about all the other things? Stress management, diet, weight, sleep, nutritional supplements. Are there any particular lifestyle things that you think are ARVC or ACM agitators? It's a very loaded, long question. Uh, I, I think it's, it's very, very critical to pay a very close attention to your lifestyle once you diagnose with any cardiac condition. It's just not only, or, or for the matter, any health condition, but more specifically for ARVC. It, it is, it's very important to avoid uh, increase or excess adrenaline in your system. And these are things that, the things that cause excess adrenaline are most importantly, one, lack of sleep, two, poor hydration, and three, excessive stress, uh, you know, during day-to-day -day life. And I think there is, there is a very uh, a big benefit to be had in having good sleep habits because lack of sleep, uh, sleep deprivation really leads to excess adrenaline. And it's, it's very predictable. Patients who have, have sleep deprivation, have dehydration, are the ones who actually end up getting uh, ventricular arrhythmias and having shocks and so on. On top of that, physical exercise acts as a, an extra stressor in patients who are in this setup. They go and they exercise. There's a super increase in their adrenaline in the system. They have very high heart rates and they induce their DT and so on and so forth. So it's very important to pay attention to lifestyle. Um, in, in particular, there's a lot of stress on uh, high intensity exercise and, and sustained exercise and so on. What I have noticed is that there's always a need to improve on what you did yesterday. So you did like a, you know, a mile and six, you want to do a mile and five and a half, you want to get to a mile and five. And that sort of, uh, you know, adaptation to do better than yesterday requires cardiac uh, adaptation. It basically requires your heart to be slicker, faster, change the ion channels to be different. Uh, and all these modifications. And this is what really is lacking in any sort of cardiomyopathy. You don't have that gift. You don't really have that extra you know, length that you can go. And the more you challenge it, the more you are gonna provoke maladaptation or maladaptive behaviors. And so um, I'm, we're not just asking stop all activity, just do things in for pleasure, do things, play a game of tennis, you know, go for a job, go for a run. But 
if you start to train, if you start to do things in a much more systematic way to actually improve on yesterday and create goals for yourself and try to achieve them, first of all, create stress because you've got to get those done or whatever. Not doing those causes, uh, or, you know, sort of a discontent on what you're doing and all sorts of things are factored in, in, in this disease progression. So what I generally advise patients is that live a normal life and do things that gives you pleasure, but don't push yourself. If the more you push yourself, the more you're challenging your heart and the more you will provoke uh, a maladaptive behavior uh, within your heart. One of those lifestyle issues is caffeine that comes up often, Hari. And I know there's there was for a long time, sort of a, I would say, uh, a totally unfounded message that if you have long QT or CPVT, thou shalt not consume any caffeine period, including caffeine and chocolate, which I would say borders on cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, my, my view has been there's zero data for normal caffeine, yes. but I've had several long QT cases uh, of highly caffeinated energy drinks where I think frankly, they're probably no good for anybody anyway, but the Red Bull Monster high, high energy caffeinated drinks are definitely not a good idea for long QT patients, CPVT patients. But what's your impression for ARBC? So uh, that's a great uh, point you bring on, Mike. There's a lot of bad information out there on coffee and, you know, uh, but, but what I would say is that it defines a person who brings 10 cups of coffee to remain awake because he doesn't want to fall asleep. That's a totally different person we're talking about. Don't blame it on the caffeine. You're just not even getting enough sleep. So I would say that a, a cup of coffee in the morning just to you know brighten your day up. And it's almost a habit for people more than something that actually caffeine delivers to them. It's just a lifestyle. It really, those sort of things are fine. You know, glass of red wine at night, it's fine. It's just being yeah. social. It's not like you're locking yourself in a room and drinking wine, you're sitting in, in, in socializing with people and so on. So I would say that those sort of normal behaviors are perfectly fine. Um, I am quite against energy drinks and stuff like that. Basically they are done with an ulterior motive, a different purpose. You need all that excess because you, thinking of doing something else at the expense of your sleep and your good habits and so on. And those are the ones that will come back. Yeah. With you. Um, so I, I, I'm completely with it. Anything that you do to improve your quality of life really yeah. is something that's good. In a free advertising spot, this was <laughs> salted caramel cold brew ran across the street to Starbucks here from Super 8 in Bemidji. So, and maybe next year, Starbucks can uh, support our program. Um, <laughs> Uh, this was kind of a tough one. I, uh, oops, somebody, the order is getting jumped around and changed because of, of the voting. So, okay, here's a good one from Su Suzanne. How common is atrial tachycardia uh, in ARVC or in CPVT? Uh, I'll do CPVT. I'll have you do ARVC because I think there's some overlap. Uh, during stress test recovery in CPVT patients, and then would the therapy suppress atrial tachycardia? Well, we don't see atrial tachycardia very much in the stress test uh, in CPVT patients at any point in the stress test from a practical standpoint, but we do see atrial tachycardias, atrial tachyarrhythmias in patients with CPVT. Not a surprise, it's taken a while to sort of publish it and prove it, but probably the best point estimate is one out of five CPVT patients have an upper chamber expression, an atrial level expression of their ryanidine receptor substrate for which uh, the medications that work for the bottom chamber substrate, the classic CPVT work for the top chamber, the atrial level arrhythmias. Um, and so Hari for ARVC, how often are you wrestling with, I mean, you might be seeing atrial arrhythmias, but how often are those part of the symptomatic problem in your patients? So it's, it's surprising how these two behave the same. It's about 25% of patients have atrial arrhythmias detected because we're looking for PVCs, we're looking for ventricular arrhythmias and whatever, this has just come to detection. How often am I actually treating those? 
I I can count on my hands and you know literally on my fingers and how many we really had to do a, a flutter ablation or go after an atrial tachycardia or even go after a pulmonary vein isolation. But atrial arrhythmias are uh, also uh, arrhythmias of, of growing up, meaning the, the more you encounter ARVC patients in their late 50s and 60s, yes, there will be some overlap of symptomatic atrial arrhythmias that you may have to address, but that is about right in the general population as well. So yeah. I would say that, yes, there is uh, reports uh, that we have published about atrial arrhythmias, but they don't seem to interfere. Uh, and and as, as, as Mike pointed out, Flacamide works fantastic for atrial arrhythmias. And really, I think most of the medication that we use to treat ARVC uh, kind of take care of the atrial arrhythmias as well. Great. And I have to say that the questions coming in this morning are amazing. I suspect we could probably do four hours, but we're almost already at the half hour mark. So uh, you all uh, who joined us for breakfast with Ari and Mike, you're incredible. And another incredible question is from Johnny. Uh, and I'm going to try to be crisp with my answers as well, because it looks like there's a lot of questions uh, as here, but she's very interested in the link between exercise training, triathlon running 10 hours per week, and the link with acquired long QT syndrome. What's the risk of continued exercise while using beta blockers for those with acquired long QT? Great, great, great question, Johnny. This is beautiful work from Peter Schwartz and Leah Crotty. I think this, this is part of the reason uh, we had this observation, we just weren't as smart as them to put it together uh, as to why we were undiagnosing so many patients with overdiagnosed long QT syndrome. And it turns out that many of them were athletes. And then when we saw them, we saw them after they had been disqualified for three, four, five, six months, and their QT phenotype was gone, vanished. And what they really showed is that acquired exercise probably shifts your QT to the right. So instead of being 440, it might be 460. Instead of being 450, it might be 470 and so forth and give the appearance of long QT syndrome, but there's no family history. There's no symptoms. There's no genetic. And I don't really like calling that exercise induced QT prolonged or even acquired long QT syndrome because I think that suggests that there's disease present. And there's not, there's just heart rate, um, heart adaptation, if you will. And there's zero data that if the only reason why your QT interval is right shifted is because of training that you are at increased rhythm risk. So my worry meter about that person be turning into a QT triggered arrhythmia is almost zero. And so I wouldn't be worried uh, at all. I think the beautiful point of that observation of Peter Schwartz and Leah's is it gives us another explanation for a reason for overdiagnosed long QT syndrome and, uh, and helps us get these people back into the game of life because unfortunately way too many got flagged for that scenario. And you can imagine, with ECG screening programs in athletes, we are going to overdiagnose the true long QT syndrome when some of these are just athlete adaptation phenomenon and not disease. Um, so I would say you should, you, from my standpoint, unless there's a surprise in your story, that my concern for you uh, is very, very low. Jackie's asking, where would you recommend a computer engineer with experience in algorithm development and AI go to support SADS research? I didn't, I didn't plan that one, Hari, but <laughs> I would say Mayo Clinic. Uh, Mayo Clinic has uh, one of the most established artificial intelligence cardiology programs in country slash world. We have all kinds of diagnostic algorithms that we've developed from what we call the artificial intelligence ECG. I think this is gonna eventually be called ECG 2.0 and will be one of the most significant advances since Eindhoven. So feel free to reach out uh, for that. Um, Christy's asking, Hari, for you, for ACM and some history of VT, don't know what that means, how do we gauge what activities are still okay? 
and which are now off limits because they might cause VT. Example, zip lining, roller coasters, hiking. Are those okay or are those now activities of the past if you've done them before or activities that you never get to do if you've never done them? Yeah, so these, these sort of uh, activities, like at least the, the three that were mentioned are slightly different from each other. One, one in the sense that when you do a uh, roller coaster, it's not really you doing anything, just sitting there through the roller coaster. And it's basically uh, an, uh, an acute adrenaline surge that happens when you go through zero gravity and so on. Whereas when people actually undertake, uh, say climbing or hiking or whatever, there's definitely a physical exertion component that goes through with it. Um, if you have done these activities in the past and you've been fine with it, I don't really have any problem for you doing that sort of an activity um, because it, in reality, it only happens in little spurts. It's not like we're going to be on the roller coaster or whatever. It's just a you know, fun thing that people do uh, and they should be allowed to have that sort of uh, you know, fun events in their life. And that's, that's the whole point of you know, living. Um, but if what I would say is that it does make sense to make sure you take your medication on that particular day, keep yourself well hydrated and so on to minimize your risk of provoking anything, uh, especially when you contemplate on these activities. On the other hand, as we talked about earlier, if you are then doing um, a, a lot of endurance sort of activities, and then you really have to discuss that with, uh, with uh, your physicians, make sure that uh, it doesn't fall in the category of you know, overstressing your heart, and also it depends upon what stage of your cardiomyopathy is, so they can be more uh, knowledgeable and advising you about that. Alicia is asking about a positive procainamide challenge. And for those out there, Hari and I would use those if we're wondering about the possibility of Brugada syndrome. And in this patient, it brought out the so-called type 1 Brugada ECG pattern. And she's wonder, wondering, does she absolutely have Brugada syndrome? And I love that question, Alicia. She's going on to say that she's 43. Her dad died of cardiac arrest at age 57, two hours after exercising. I would interject there that statistically, your father's death at that age is far more likely to be a lot of things called not Brugada syndrome. So there's other reasons for that. But I think to your question, Alicia, um, just because you reacted that way to that chemical called procainamide that gave that ECG, a type one Brugada ECG, in my book, uh, does not equal Brugada syndrome. It's a drug-induced reaction that may or may not indicate the presence of a true syndrome, and often it may not. Um, that's controversial, what I just said, probably. Uh, but Dr. Tondre, I'm curious how you have landed on this this kind of a question. I completely agree. I think we are way over-diagnosing Brugada syndrome based on the propionamide originally challenge test. Uh, there are lots of patients who have what looks like incomplete right bundle and being referred for Brugada and being diagnosed with a procainamide challenge. Procainamide, by design, blocks sodium channels and causes the sodium channel dysfunction acutely. And, and there are going to be a subset of people who will, will show a pattern in the ECG that can be construed as Brugada pattern, but that doesn't really tell you anything. Um, more important is just going back in the history. Uh, if, you, if you had uh, access to your parents' ECG before uh, the, the, the event happened and it showed a typical Brugada pattern, there, then there is much more validity to all these findings. Uh, you can even go one generation up uh, and look at your grandparents uh, and even look at their ECGs too. And we have done that in, in, in occasions where uh, we had uh, someone presenting with uh, 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 ECG that was abnormal and asking the same question and you go back and look at it and the dad had the same pattern. The, the, they all had the same pattern, but really nothing to show for in their entire history. So there are patients with the ECG pattern who have nothing happening in their, in their lifetime, suggesting that the pattern alone doesn't help you at all. So it's a combination of having the pattern with appropriate symptoms of like syncope or, 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 or having arrhythmias that really puts together. And then of course you do the genetic testing to prove the point that this is indeed a, a genetic channel opening. Great. 
Anna is asking, and I love this question because it's it's actually one of the easy ones, but maybe for many people, they, we've confused them by our, our messaging out there because she's asking, what medicines can you take for a cold or a cough with CPVT? And it's beautiful with this one because if you have CPVT and I like the treatment that you're on, you can take everything. You can take any cough medicine, any cold medicine, doesn't matter the brand, doesn't matter the trade name. I'll throw out Robitussin. That's what I always gave my kids uh, uh, for cough and so forth. Tylenol, cold. There's not a single over-the-counter cold cough medicine that would make me CPVT nervous. And it also wouldn't make me ARVC nervous either. Uh, what about for you, Hari? Any cough, colds? I think we've made a lot of patients so afraid to take anything that we've left them have three days of misery with cough and colds because we've kind of messaged that you can't take anything. I, I think I have no restriction at all. And patients who are adequately treated and who are uh, who basically cruise controlling on a beta blocker or a combination of beta blocker and flecamide, I really don't restrict them from taking any medication at all. Um, that this often, I get a text saying, can I take this and can I take that and whatever. And my usual answer is yes. Um, so I, it's really, I think the more you search um, the internet, you will find reports of interaction here, interaction there. But having seen uh, thousands of patients with uh, the, the, the same issues, we haven't really noticed anything at all. And our usual answer is go ahead and do it. Yeah. Don't be much of uh, Anne is asking about metoprolol. And if it's dangerous, if you already have low blood pressure, premature beats, dizziness, she's been told she has Brigada and her doctor's recommending it. And she's saying, this doesn't make sense to me since it's used to treat high blood pressure. Well, I think you're really bright, uh, Alicia, for asking the question. I'm not sure that we really have any evidence that you need to be on a beta blocker anyway for Brugada. And so somebody who's already dealing with orthostatic dizziness, lightheadedness, low blood pressure, I think your intuition about that beta blocker not making great sense, I would just say you're spot on, unless there's other things that, that Dr. Tondry and I aren't uh, aware of in this question. Ari, um, is heart rate the best measurement for level of activity for ARVC? If yes, do you provide a heart rate guidance? This per Stephen's asking, what is the max heart rate for 30 minutes of daily exercise. Uh, do you give a heart rate uh, ceiling? This, I don't usually give a heart rate ceiling. And this has actually uh, become a very, very common question that I get asked, especially since the advent of Apple Watch and Fitbits where people can actually monitor their heart rate. It wasn't a problem at all when this wasn't even available. Uh, nobody knew what their heart rate was. And now that everybody knows, they're asking about what's the ceiling, what should I hit, and whatever. And honestly, um, I have to admit that I do come up with some arbitrary numbers, but I'm cornered to the wall to ask for uh, a, a number. Um, it, if they have had a um, history of VT, and I know that they are going to induce VT once they get their heart rate about 150 or whatever, usually it happens during cool down more than during the actual activity itself. I can curb that level of activity by curbing the heart rate. I'll just say, keep your heart rate below 130 and you'll be good. What I'm really trying to tell them is that don't push yourself. Do not, do not uh, you know, get your heart rate all the way up there. We really do not spend too much time on the treadmill running too fast. So I'm actually giving them a message in a different way. Um, I think one of the important things about the heart rate is, uh, is also that uh, the days when you're dehydrated, you're probably going to jump your heart rate too high really too quickly too. So all of those things that you do before you and uh, you kind of involve yourself in this activity mean a lot. I would say that anything that you're doing on a routine basis, don't, don't escalate it, pay attention to the hydration, pay attention to sleep and so on. Heart rate becomes less of an issue at the time point. Yeah, I think there's some fascinating research uh, that might teach us in ARVC uh, that has been taught to us in CPVT, where Christina Hauga uh, in Oslo, Norway, and her team has shown that there may be a potential for a training effect uh, to lower your ectopy burden. In other words, what they've shown is let's say our CPVT patient 
starts to show those skip beats during exercise when the heart rate is 140. Well, what she suggested is that if you then put the ceiling at 90% of that onset heart rate for irregular beats, that the next time you stress test them, you don't see the ectopy start at 140. You might see it now not start until 150 and then 160, and then you move that 90%. So in my CPVT athletes who are serious athletes, we are starting to take advantage of that observation to see if we can train away, if you will, uh, the ectopy. And, and given the overlap between CPVT and ARVC, it will be quite interesting if there is that potential to have that kind of a training effect on when does ectopy start or, um, but it may not hold up in ARVC. Hari, I'm curious what your thoughts a priority would be when it may not be linear, like in CPVT, we sort of see, okay, at this heart rate, the ectopy comes out, but in ARVC patients, they may have their ectopy at rest during the stress test in the recovery phase. So it might be harder for this to work in ARVC. Yes, yes, definitely. I think uh, even when we put patients on beta blocker, the, the bradycardia unmasks these ectopy and now they previously did not have it. And now because of longer diastolic intervals, now they start having ectopy. So structural uh, heart disease complicates ARVC to an extent where it's gonna be hard to tease out uh, what is exercise induced adaptation in the ion channels, but then the structural component to it as well. So uh, overall, I think we try to keep them in a place where they're not too much bothered by their PVCs uh, and, and have no episodes of sustained VT, but at the same time, kind of lead a good um, healthy quality of life. Steven has a question for you, Hari. He's obviously very, this is your second one, Steven, so you get a bonus today, um, but, it's, but it's a really good one. He's obviously very, very ARVC savvy. He's aware that there may be up to 12 ARVC or ACM susceptibility genes. And he's wondering if there are genotype specific nuances in how say one ARVC flavor shows itself versus another. And the one he's most interested in, because I bet it's his, is DSC2, which is a gene that encodes a protein called desmocolin. So I think we know the most about PKP2 ARVC in terms of the exercise effect, and that may not actually be true for some of the other desmosomal proteins, but where are we in starting to tailor therapy based upon genotype like we do in long QT syndrome? I suspect we're not very much there yet, um, but what do you think, Hari? I, I can tell you in really broad strokes, I think we know that the, the, the genes that include called placoflin and, and so on, they basically have um, sort of a predominant right ventricular uh, involvement. LV does get involved, but it really doesn't matter all that much in the long run because there isn't much of a functional uh, component in LV uh, involvement. Whereas if you look at desmosomal, like desmoplac and desmocol and desmoglein and, and, and uh, the phospholamba and sort of four different things, where you do have some degree of LV involvement, even a diagnosis, and there could be a sort of a progression in the long term. But these are very broad strokes. But then individually, when you look at it, when you look at families, there's clustering. Uh, in, this, in a family, if you look at um, of one type of mutation, you could expect a very similar course for the other person in the same family too. So there are other um, genetic uh, influences, if you will, that are, are individualized to each family, which confound the development of phenotype within the family. So um, as Mike rightly pointed out, we, we're not there yet about specifically looking at um, each mutation and trying to come up with a tailor-made therapy. Uh, but gene editing is coming through. And in that sort of situation, we're taking one gene at a time to see if we can manipulate that to see if that leads to a better outcome. Uh, the clinical trials are, uh, the, 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 they will start in the near future. I would think that there are lots of uh, uh, industry partners who are interested in uh, partnering with us to actually identify what will be the first targets to go after. 
uh, in that that would be personalized medicine. That would be very individualized to each mutation, and we'll learn a lot with those uh, clinical trials. And you mentioned Hari gene therapy, and Anith is asking uh, about how close are we to finding a cure for long QT syndrome? Any hope to see in her lifetime? And she's 37. And I think, uh, Anith, I would say yes, there is hope in, in, in your lifetime. Uh, I think the cure in long QT syndrome, uh, I'm skeptical of it being sort of the CRISPR-Cas9 gene edited solution because that's a requirement of a unique gene edited solution for each and every mutation. And there's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And so the economics, mathematics don't work in my mind uh, for that. But as you may know, uh, we have launched and discovered a new way of doing it, kind of out with the old, in with the new gene therapy that we call suppression replacement gene therapy. We've proven it in the dish for LQT1. Our proof in the dish for LQT2 just got accepted and will come out in circulation and genomics and precision medicine in the very near future. And the gene therapy for rabbits engineered to have either LQT1 or LQT2 is being tested as we speak. So the last rabbits were just injected a couple weeks ago. And so if it cures the rabbits ECG, uh, then I would say we are probably two years away from the first in human uh, testing of that gene therapy. Uh, as Dr. Hari uh, Tandri mentioned, there's similar strategies uh, in the structural cardiomyopathies um, that are very exciting. I think we've never seen a time. I, I'm, this is my 22nd year uh, on staff at Mayo Clinic. And I would say I've never seen a time uh, where in the last two years, there's been an explosion of interest for novel therapies for the diseases that Dr. Tandri and I love. Um, Amazing. No, no comparison, the first 20 years versus the last two years. So there's a lot of reason to be pretty optimistic, don't you think, Hari? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is a great time to be in this field. I think uh, so much um, uh, enthusiasm to, uh, to bring all these to fruition. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll see something uh, within the next uh, decade. We'll have some, something solid to offer to these patients. So Kimberly's wondering, she's been diagnosed with long QT, no genetic markers. That always makes me raise a flag. Um, there is truly genetically elusive or what we call genotype negative long QT syndrome. The number with that remnant of genetically not figured out long QT is shrinking is probably 10 to 15%, but sounds like she has it. She has a defibrillator, it saved her numerous times. Are there other medical options than natal and maxillotine? That's what she's been on, um, but seem to be working. Been told sympathectomy uh, seems a big jump. I'd only say um, it's not a big jump at all. For my patient, if they have long QT syndrome and they're getting shocked, and if there's any sense that that trigger is catecholamine adrenaline driven, there is tremendous therapeutic benefit of left cardiac sympathetic denervation. We've learned that for long QT. We now know that for CPVT. And it's not going to surprise people out there that even in our structural cardiomyopathies, HCM, ARVC, where you have an impression of a catecholamine adrenaline driver, denervation therapy is going to become an increasingly helpful part of treatment in patients with ARVC. We've now done it in several. Uh, I'm curious if you've had that impression yet, Hari, although I would say I'm not suggesting that denervation is going to replace or bump up uh, ablation because I think ablation has a unique uh, place in the management of ACM arrhythmias, but general observations there. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, so. I look at it as different uh, therapeutic options that we can offer to patients at different levels. The medication acts systemically. We have ablation, which is much more focused to the heart. And clearly, the innovation takes, uh, takes out another component of arrhythmogenesis, which is the uh, catabolin induced 
change in the cardiac conductivity, right? So adrenaline has profound effects on how impulse or the electricity propagates to the heart. And it is very important for the coordination of arrhythmogenesis. So for instance, if all heart muscles have to be faster, they have to communicate in a way and then the nerve cells satisfy that by making sure that they can all coordinate this activity for fast ventricular arrhythmias, both ventricular tachycardias and ventricular fibrillation, of course, which is a common thing, and especially in long QT and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we found that this is an excellent uh, you know, addition to the therapeutic options that we have right now, in addition to putting patients on medication and ablation, if they fail these two steps, we are now going to uh, offer them uh, uh, cardiac synthetic denervation as a, an, an another option that's available on the table. And we've had excellent results with uh, cardiac synthetic denervation in not only in patients with ARVC, uh, also in patients with sarcoidosis and patients with uh, and other forms of uh, what we call non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, uh, where we have identified that there's fast VTs and especially those that occur uh, with some sort of an adrenergic trigger. Thanks, Hari. Here's a great one. Type 1 long QT child patient, low heart rate, implanted loop recorder. The EP is suggesting leadless pacemaker and potentially a single lead ICD. The child's 10. The parents are reluctant to proceed with denervation due to known complications. Is this a feasible plan? The reason I like this question so much, Hari, is I think there's so much misinformation and lack of a balanced conversation between uh, risks and benefits of the various therapies uh, and the treatments that are available. So we just recently published a very transparent paper about all of the warts and wrinkles of all of the therapies used in the long QT in our nearly 2000 patients at Mayo. We also published a paper about the spectrum of therapies. And it was fascinating to see that, that we have over 20, 21 to be, uh, 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 exact, unique LQT therapies, 21 different therapies that have been implemented in our long QT patients. Again, not a one size fits all. And when you look at those, so I'm struck with the question of concerned about denervation complications, but seemingly to think that a leadless pacemaker and a single lead ICD in a 10 year old or a 10 year old in their future isn't riddled with its own complication package. Everything has potential complications. And my, from my vantage point, LQT1, not liking current therapies, the denervation is an amazing solution because it's a one time therapy. We have many patients, as in over 100, who are on denervation solo therapy. That's the only therapy. Most of those are LQT1 because we know that the therapeutic impact efficacy is absolutely the best in LQT1. And as to the complication package, I think it's been uh, misstated and missized. It's not complication free, but if you take the trade, many of our patients would take the trade every day with the denervation and its uncommon side effects compared to say the reason they chose it, which they had hated their life on beta blocker. Now, many, many patients don't hate life on beta blocker. Uh, and we certainly have a skewed ascertainment bias because those who come for it have already self-selected and saying, I don't like my life feeling this way on beta blockers. So the complication package, although not zero for denervation, I think is much lower than what this family is under the impression it is, especially if they're thinking that a leadless pacemaker in a prepubertal or even an adolescent or a young adult is a complication-free uh, solution. Uh, Mike, I have a quick um, add-on to that. The, the, one of the things about uh, cardiac uh, innervation, and is that any role of cardiac innervation in the developmental phase uh, of the heart, for instance, uh, in the early phase, the cardiac development is not complete until the age of 18, probably until 20, the heart's still growing. Um, 
And one of the things that there is really no data to support this, that dinner, uh, deneration earlier on has any impact on cardiac development at all. Uh, but this yeah, is a great question. We just have not seen any indicator of that. So we've done denervations as early as two weeks of age, wow. as in an infant. Uh, we do, um, you know, because of that old data suggesting that it might affect contractility, this came out of some dog studies. We've been obliged to sort of check an echo every so often, as in every three to five years. There's been a, never a hint of any impact on heart chamber size, heart contractility, uh, just nothing in terms of structure, function, hemodynamic performance uh, that has caused us to sort of, you know, uh, consider that that possible more long term uh, implication to 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 the heart development. So we have not seen anything to suggest that. Um, so I think that's been encouraging. Uh, Just for the yeah. listeners, I think that the, the, one of the important points is that the heart has its own nervous system patched right on top of it. And it's completely functional and independent without the nerves that are coming from the brain. So independent of what's happening, uh, the neural inputs that come from the top, the heart has all the information that it needs literally patched right on top of it called the intrinsic nervous system. So that, that explains why that detaching these nerves has really no long-term effect. And this is what happens when you have a heart transplant. You basically take the heart from one person to put it in the other person, but the nerves are all intact right on top of the heart itself. So, that, yeah. so this is a very important point to, to remember that uh, a denervated heart really means that it doesn't have any um, nerves coming from the top, but the intrinsic nervous system is still intact. Yeah. Well, Stephen, this is your lucky day because I'm just taking them in order in real time and you get the trifecta as in three questions. So you might set the indoor record for the most questions from one person, but I have to choose it and not skip it because it's a, also a good one for you, Ari. And he's wondering, does the age at which you are actually diagnosed with ARVC affect the progression of the disease? He was diagnosed with his ARVC at age 69, but from a practical standpoint, he thinks he's had symptomatic PVCs for at least 35 years before that. So sure. when he was officially diagnosed was 69, but maybe when he first had symptoms consistent with his unknown ARVC substrate might've been in his early thirties. That's a great question, Stephen. That's a great, fantastic question. Uh, it is true that the mutation happens at birth. So you are in predisposition to ARVC starts when you're born. And the trajectory of that really determines when you present clinically. So we have people presenting at the age of uh, 13 or 14 with sustained DT, already having some degree of RV dysfunction. And we have clearly people presenting in their late 50s or 60s presenting with the first episode of DT or uh, have had PVCs all their life and somebody bothered to do an echocardiogram and show your heart is dilated. Um, and, and yes, they meet all criteria and get ARVC. And now you can clearly see how the trajectory is very different of these two patients. The one who presented at 13, I'm really concerned by the age of 30, you might need a heart transplant. Or uh, what would this be if I connect the dots on how fast the, the, the substrate or the, or the heart is progressing uh, we may have to really keep a very close eye on uh, this particular patient, but uh, you're right, it may take another uh, uh, 40, 50 years for your heart to blossom and, and, and actually show some signs of failure and so on. So it is very important, the age of diagnosis and age of presentation has a big bearing on how we view how uh, you know, ferocious the, the mutation is and what it actually um, does to the structure of your heart. So I think being diagnosed at 60 is a great thing. Um, it just tells you that your uh, uh, the arrhythmic progression or even the structural progression is not as, um, as uh, fierce as, as many other mutations. Um, and so it does uh, have a good prognosis. Great. Um, Samantha is a medical intern in South Africa and she's saying she's likely to get uh, a needle stick injury at some point given her profession it may need to take HIV prophylaxis. Is the TLD regimen safe for long QT? Well, Samantha, I, I'm not exactly sure what 
the three letters all represent in terms of the treatment cocktail for HIV prophylaxis in terms of the T, L, and the D. What I do know is if one of those letters includes a protease inhibitor, we published many years ago now uh, in Lancet that the HIV protease inhibitors in general provide conferred drug-induced QT prolongation and have actually surmised that perhaps in some HIV individuals who succumb to sudden death, where in the past they might have just been attributed to, oh, maybe suicide, that these could well be some drug-induced sudden cardiac deaths from their HIV protease inhibitors. So if somebody already has long QT syndrome, the HIV protease inhibitors would be on the CredibleMeds.org hit list. And I wouldn't say that you can't take them, but I would say that if you were in that situation, this may be a place where doing pre-drug and on-drug QT monitoring to see if you're acting as a QT reactor, where your QT is reacting to that drug combination, that TLD. And if you react, then maybe we need to revise. If you're not reacting, then I think the risk of that combination agitating your underlying long QT is super low. Suzanne's asking if ventricular hypertrophy, can it be missed on an echocardiogram? And I like this question a lot because it brings us back to something we talked about earlier, which was ECG 2.0 or the artificial intelligence ECG. And we at Mayo have developed the AI ECG uh, hypertrophy detector or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy detector. And in some situations, it's actually better than the echo. So we now have examples where the AI ECG said the patient has HOCAM, HCM. The echo called it normal. The MRI showed it clearly. So there's certain ultrasound windows and certain places where the hypertrophy can show that sometimes the echo just doesn't quite see it as well. And these are, these are sort of focal hypertrophs, if you will. And so yes, it could be missed, not very often, um, but one of the things that's happening now is when you get this advanced electrical tool that says the electrical signals in the heart are not right. There's a heart muscle problem. And your, your heart muscle tool, whether it's an ultrasound to start with, isn't showing it, don't stop. We have advanced imaging tools. And I'll let Ari comment on how many cases of missed ARVC has he seen in his career because they stopped at the echo and didn't do a cardiac MRI, which then more clearly showed the problem. Now, Ari, you can comment too. The, there's been plenty of overdiagnosed ARVC yes, 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 yes. of the MRI as well. So yeah. it's not. A, I'm not saying that the MRI is the perfect ultrasound tool or the imaging tool. It sort of happens to be also connected to whose eyes and whose brain uh, behind those eyes is staring at the images. Uh, but what say you on the imaging for cardiomyopathy? Uh, sure, I th this is a great question. I think it really boils down to what we call a pretest probability, really taking a look at the entire picture, not just one test or one investigation. Um, uh, I, I, I completely agree with that. There's no one particular pattern of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or ACM where there are many different um, uh, variations in it. Uh, ECG is a holistic view of looking at it. If ECG shows that there is something not right with your heart muscle, uh, then you have to pay close attention to see what am I missing, especially if you have asymmetric uh, hypertrophies and if you have apical variants that can easily be missed on a quick echo where you didn't really focus on those windows. Um, ARVC is much of a bigger problem because the right ventricle is not even looked at. Many, many echocardiographers don't even focus uh, their attention on the right ventricle. It's always looking at the LV, saying the function is good, um, so there's nothing wrong with you. Um, so based, we've, we've had several cases where there has been a big aneurysm in the base of the RV completely missed by echocardiogram. When you do an MRI and you see that along the same lines, 
if you do not know how to interpret cardiac MRI, the right ventricle is uh, it has several different variations even among normal people. And sometimes the wall of the right ventricle can be tethered to the back of your chest by a, a, a mechanical tether a piece of fascia. And that makes the right ventricle contractility look very different, but it's still normal. So there have been lots of overcall as well. So it speaks to two things. One, if there is a a piece of data that doesn't line up, pay more attention, don't rely on one investigation to, to refute it. Uh, two, make sure that the data are interpreted by people who actually have uh, expertise in that field and have spent a long time trying to look uh, to see what are the normal variants and how abnormalities can present themselves in different ways. All right, thanks, Hari. And I'm looking at our time and we have about five minutes left, Hari, and then if, for everyone, I do need to uh, head over to uh, the family funeral. And I'm looking at the incredible list of people who've joined us. And I just will give a shout out to one. She's giving her last name, not too many, but uh, uh, Pamela, you know who you are. Uh, I adore you. So this is a wonderful family. And she's she's continues to inspire me with the care of her children and grandchildren. Um, and then not a patient, but one of my most dearest, most favorite people, I see that Dr. Susan Etheridge is, uh, is in the group as well. So uh, Susan, um, uh, great to see your, your name and to uh, be a partner of yours uh, in our mission at the SADS Foundation. So here we go. Um, now rapid fire for about four minutes. Uh, this could take all four of the minutes though, but She's asking if a mutation in the RYR2 gene causes both CPVT and ARVD2, how is a patient diagnosed with the correct condition? Um, I love it because it's not easy. Um, but part of the thing I would suggest is I, for one, am not convinced that mutations in RYR2, the, the gene that encodes the ryanidine receptor, actually is a cause of ARVD. Uh, I don't know what's the strength of that evidence. There's a whole exercise for the families to go on to know where a lot of genes that have been published as causing specific diseases, the strength of that so-called disease gene association is being called into question or challenged based upon our knowledge of 2022 not based upon our knowledge of the year 2000. And so this is not for any of the major genes. So all of the big genes, the, those will never go away. Those will never be challenged because there's no doubt about it. But some of the minor genes, including disease genes that my team published, uh, which have been many of them, maybe the strength of that minor gene association for that implicated disease is not as strong as it needs to be to be uh, to have no doubt that that gene is responsible for that disease. And, and so there's a lot of cleanup work going on in the genetic cardiology, genetic disease gene discovery world. A lot of us have rolled up our sleeves to say game on. If we really believe that gene is the true cause, maybe we need to mount more evidence to prove it. Uh, and so in here, uh, I would just submit that we know that mutations in the ryanidine receptor is the clear cause for two thirds of all CPVT. We know that there's a new ryanidine receptor disease, which is the opposite side of the coin of loss of function in the ryanidine receptor called calcium release channel deficiency syndrome whether mutations in the ryanidine receptor can actually cause heart muscle disorders like ARVC, mm, I'm a little bit of a skeptic. I'm gonna give Hari the last word on that, but there is some data that's come out suggesting that mutations in the ryanidine receptor may be able to cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as a minor hokum gene. So I'm not willing to say, no way on ryanidine receptor and ARVC. I'm just saying uh, my, my eyes and my brain are not yet convinced of that association. All right, last word on ryanidine receptor gene and being responsible for your disease 
and given the specific header of ARVD2 as the placeholder in the literature. So I I am on the same side as Mike. I think that there is there is two things: association and causality. So there has been associations of rhinitis and receptor mutations in patients with ARVC. But that being said, I would say 50% of ARVC patients do not have any mutation that's found. So you have to account for that as well. Uh, the one other way of explaining the possible association is the upstream and downstream effects of a mutation that yet unknown, like we don't really know exactly what mutation it is, but the upstream and downstream effects can account for some of the changes in other associated genes, but not as a direct causality, like they don't really exactly cause it. So whenever we see a mutation in a patient with absolutely no structural abnormalities detected, we kind of assume that that mutation probably, uh, you know, this is, if you see a random receptor mutation, no structural uh, problems, but purely arrhythmic, you, you, uh, you put that in the bin of CPVT. Once you see some structural changes, you'd say, oh, this could be ARVC resulting from the same mutation, although this could just be a simple association. So I, I kind of, um, I agree with Mike that the, the, the jury's not out yet. It did make up to, it did made uh, up to the, the ARVC genes panel, so taking it out from there will require a lot of data because it's already made it to this uh, to, to that uh, to that uh, line item. Um, so I think we will know a lot more once we start to understand the specific functions of these uh, mutations and with more genotype phenotype uh, correlations down the road. Right. Well, thanks, Hari and, and Alice. If uh, Marsha is there, we'll have Aaron bring up Marsha to say goodbye Wait. to us. We just um, had one last question, Mike, that six, uh, at least six other people have also asked if you can, was promoted to the top. And that is, can beta blockers negatively affect the effectiveness of my birth control medication? Okay, oh, I can see why that could make it to the top. Um, so I think uh, there must, we might need to deal with fake news. Uh, so <laughs> fake news is everywhere. And maybe that's another myth buster, but I think there's, from a practical standpoint, there's zero data that beta blockers of natalol would make an, a hormonal-based uh, oral contraceptive less effective. Now, I'm not aware of anything that has any legs to it. And obviously, non-hormonal contraceptives like IUDs and so forth, medicines like a beta blocker would have zero, zero, as in no way, no how. Um, Hari, have you heard of anything about beta blockers and no. oral contraceptive efficacy? No, no, not at all. I think uh, definitely fake news 101. <laughs> yes. Well, we could do not only breakfast with Hari, but we could do lunch, dinner, and dessert with all the <laughs> other questions uh, that there are. They have been amazing questions. It's been wonderful to join everybody who woke up this morning with Dr. Tandri and me. Dr. Tandri and I, we, we did this last time together and I loved it then and I loved it now. It's great to be alongside you and with you and I appreciate you taking the time out of your Saturday morning to, to have breakfast with me in this way. Marsha, thank you for arranging it. And Marsha, we'll give you the last word before I uh, pack up and, and go to a, a different kind of celebration. But it, it is uh, for Eric and his family, it indeed is a celebration. Yeah, Not too many people get to die on their birthday. So Eric died on his 64th birthday and immediately launched into eternal glory. So, um, uh, uh, so we will be heading off to that celebration soon as Marsha says goodbye to us. But Marsha, you get the last word. Well, I just want to say thank you, Mike and Hari, for all the fabulous answers. And I thank all our families for participating uh, this morning. We will be uh, re re rejoining in the next session with our welcome in about 15 minutes. Not about so, five minutes. About five oh, minutes. We'll a little bit early. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, all right. Thank keep you going. so much, thank Mike you. and Hari. Appreciate Mar your time. Marsha, Mike, thank you very much. This is my uh, one year catch up of long QD. I love Mike's answers. You know, lots of education for me too. It's fantastic. I think thanks for putting this together. And I, I love every minute of this. Great. Thanks, You're everyone. Welcome. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>